welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. So what do you say? Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come and to be our teacher. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're very grateful that we get to come into the house of the Lord today. God, it's so good that we can come into your presence and praise you, worship you, God. And Lord, we thank you for the work that you've already done in hearts and lives. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to go further with you. We want to go deeper, God. And so we pray that as we open up your word, Lord, that you would open us up to receive it. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have the good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. How wise you are, God, that you can speak to each and every person here on their level, Lord, dealing with their situation, God. And you can speak that ready word in season to each and every one, God. That's awesome, Lord. And we just give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing for ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, God. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them, and at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we also remember Pastor Jim and Deborah in our prayers, Lord. We pray that you strengthen them, encourage them, and bless them as they minister your word to pastors, God. And may their churches be built and grown and prospered. And God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. I'd like to welcome those of you that are joining us on the live stream. It's always uh, great to see how many of you guys are joining us from around the United States and all over the planet. And welcome. Uh, Get your Bible out too today as we go to the word of the Lord. We're in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We've been in Hebrews chapter 4 for uh, quite a while, quite a many months now. And we finally made it to verse number 15. We're we're coming to the end of Hebrews chapter 4, and it's just been phenomenal, the word and the encouragements that have been coming out of Hebrews chapter 4. Today, I believe it's no different. Last week, we heard, let me tell you something. Last week, we heard the best message we have ever heard on compassion. Let me me just recap it for, for you guys, that we are to see, we are to have the eyes of God, and we are to look around us. And not just see and do nothing with it or be apathetic about it or lethargic. No, we are to feel something. We're to allow the Spirit of God to move on our emotions and our, and our lives and for us to not just see but to feel. And then because of that, now we sympathize and we move with compassion and we do something about it. Today, I believe that we're going to launch from that understanding into some areas of our lives as the Spirit of God directs our attention in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize or have compassion with our weaknesses. Look at this. But was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And I want to point out some words to you there in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Now look at the next couple of words. But was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now that terminology, all points, means that there was a, a number that was attached to that. You could say that there are a number of ways that temptation and trials and problems and pressures come into our lives. And Jesus was tempted in all points. That same number, Jesus was tempted. We, we get a, a, a peek into it in the scripture where Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. There in the wilderness, he's tempted, and we see three different temptations that take place. And you could line those up with the three different things that are, are, are shown to us in 1 John about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Here's Jesus and the devil's tempting him, saying, you know, lust of the flesh, t- turn these stones into bread. Aren't you the Son of God? If you are the Son of God, go ahead, go ahead, satisfy your hunger. You've been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Go ahead and turn these into bread. And and remember, Jesus was tempted, but he did not enter into sin. He said, no, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Goes on, and the devil lifts him up to the pinnacle of the temple, says, throw yourself down. Doesn't the word say that they will not allow you to cast your foot against a stone? And, And once again, Jesus refutes him with the word, saying that we should not tempt the Lord our God. Finally, the devil tempts him. With the pride of life, and he says, you know what? It's the right thing for you to inherit all the kingdoms of the earth. You are to be the ruler, and I'll give that to you if you just bow down and worship me. See, it was the right thing, but the wrong way. And so Jesus said, away from me, devil, get get, get out of here. Why? Because it is written that you should only worship the Lord your God alone. 
And so here Jesus is, he's, he's perfectly tempted by, by the devil, and yet he was without sin. Now, I believe that there may have been other ways that Jesus was tempted throughout his life because the devil went away looking for an opportune time. And there was anguish, there was agony that Jesus went through. And there in the garden, he's praying, and we, we get a peek into his humanity, into the frailty that he experienced when he was asking God, God, if it be, may there be a, a, another way, and yet not my will, but your will be done. Asking the Lord, may this cup pass from me. And yet he says, not my will, but yours be done. The Bible tells us that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And that just blows my mind because God so invested himself in humanity and he came and he lived the human experience and was in all points, as many points as you and I are tempted, Jesus Christ himself was tempted yet was without sin. And so he can help us. He can come and he can sympathize. He can have compassion and deal mercifully with us. Now think about this for a second. If you had a doctor, right? Maybe you, you had broken your arm and you went to the doctor. A doctor could help you that had never broken his arm. Right, he could go ahead and he could set that bone, right, you know, and get it in place, and then he could put a cast on it, and he could help you. But it, it, it might be a better experience if the doctor had experienced breaking his arm too, because he knew the pain of when it was set in, and he could tell you, now this is going to hurt, okay, and, and I'm going to do it gently so that it doesn't hurt too much, but I'm just warning you in advance, and so here we go, here, I, right, and you go, you know, and he gets it back in place and puts the cast on. See, for me, I, I, I want somebody who's been there. I want somebody who knows the pain and, and who can tell me what's coming up. I, I, I want a dentist who doesn't want to hurt me. <laughs> can you say amen? amen. See, see, even though I, I love our dentist, I mean, come on. Help us out a little bit. I, I don't want you getting pleasure from my pain. <laughs> see, think about it this way. You, you may be able to go to a clinical psychologist, tell them your problems, but isn't it much better to have a friend who knows what you're going through, who can sympathize? See, all the money in the world can't buy you that. Why? Because they can say, hey, I know what you're going through. Hey, I know the pain that you're experiencing. I, 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 know, the, I know the process that you're going through and the problems and the temptations. You're going to want to quit. You're going to want to give up. It's going to hurt. But listen, you can do this. You can make it. I made it out, and so can you. See, that's sympathy. That's, that's where we want to live. Jesus Christ was tempted in all points, as, as many ways as we are, yet was without sin. Now Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I've been there and I've done that and I have overcome and now here's the way that you should walk in. And that's what this is all about. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, God has your number. Look at your other neighbor and say, God has my number. <laughs> Title of today's message is God has your number. God knows us completely. God was tempted in all points. That number, God was tempted. There are other numbers that we see in the Bible that God knows about us. Turn with me in your Bible to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And there in Luke chapter 12, we're going to take a look at a couple of verses Luke chapter 12, verse number 6 and verse number 7. Now, Jesus is teaching on the fear of God. He's teaching us that we should have a healthy respect and awe of God because it doesn't matter what men do to your body. They could just kill your body, but that doesn't, doesn't go any further than that. But that we should fear God who can kill our body but also cast us into hell. Now, sometimes when people hear that, they want to back off of God because they say, well, wait a second, I'm afraid of that, I don't want that, and if God is this grumpy old man in the clouds somewhere waiting to throw me into hell, I don't want to have any part of that. And yet Jesus isn't talking about that. The reason why we know that is because verse 6 and verse 7 come along. Take a look at it with me. Luke chapter 12, verse number 6 says, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Now, you know you've been sitting there at McDonald's. It's a nice day. And so you sit outside. And there you are sitting there eating your Big Mac and your supersized fries. And what happens? A fat little sparrow comes up, sits on the seat next to you, right? Sits on the top of the seat. And he's just chirping away, looking at you sideways, being cute. And you think, okay, all right, cute little guy. You know, let me, let me throw him a little bone here. You know, and you break off a piece of a French fry and you throw it onto the ground next to that chair where the sparrow's seated. Now, what happens when you do that? 
16 stealth sparrows just come out of nowhere, right? All of them as fat as the first one. And they're all peeping around and fighting and this and that. And so you start throwing some more French fries. The reason why they got so fat is because they're living on greasy French fries, right? <laughs> What's the point? The Bible tells us that five sparrows are sold for two copper coins. They, they have little value. You can get five for two, right? And not one of them is forgotten before God. God knows each and every one of those fat little sparrows. All 16 of them, God knows where they're at. Now take a look at verse number 7. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. See, God's got your number. God knows the number of hairs on your head, whether how many or how few. I'm not looking at anybody, okay? <laughs> very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear. Therefore, wait a second. I was just told I was supposed to be in fear of God. How can I fear but not be in fear? Well, see, when you fear God, you don't fear man. When you fear God and you have a healthy respect for God and in awe of God, now you don't have to fear hell because God's love and his fear will keep you in a place where you'll be with him. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. See, you could lump up all the fat sparrows you want into one big pile, into one big cage, gather them from the north, south, east, and west, and pile them up. And yet that wouldn't even come close to the value that God placed on your life because Jesus didn't die for a sparrow. He died for you and I. That's the value that's on our life. God has our number. God has our number. He knows us completely, and he loves us deeply. God has our number. A couple of things that we see in the Bible today we're going to go through Quickly, that we'll see that God has the number of when it pertains to our lives. God has the number. Are you ready for them today? Yes. All right, good. I'm glad that the front row is ready. How about y'all in the back? Are you guys ready back there? Yes. Did you come to church today? All right, praise the Lord. God has the number. Number one, he has the number of our days. God has the number of our days. Listen, Jesus came and he lived and he died. And he knows not only the years of our life, but he also knows the life in our years. We say that again. Jesus knows not only the years of our life, but he also knows the life of our years. In other words, in 33 years, look at what Jesus did. It's not about having a long life. It's about having a full life like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here Jesus comes, and in the Gospel of John, it records that if you took all of the works that Jesus did and you wrote them down, that probably the world could not contain the books that could be written. Jesus lived his life on purpose. He was led of the Spirit of God. He was full of the Spirit of God. Everywhere he went, he was, he was, he was on a divine destiny. He was on a course of purpose. He had a plan. There was an appointment for him. He said, I must go through this way. I've got to go that way. I've I got to go down here. I've I got to fulfill the prophecies and the scriptures. I need to, I need to do something. I've got to touch somebody. I'm going to go away from the 99 and go after the one. See, Jesus lived his life on purpose. And sometimes we think that we're just going to live out our days here on the earth and just float through life and not have a purpose, not have a destiny, not have anything to do. Listen, God is not interested in you just existing on the planet. God wants you to live a life of faith. God wants you to live a life of purpose. God has a plan for your life. He's got a destiny. God is bringing you into a course. God wants you to go and do something. And God knows the number of your days. Knows each and every one of them. Let's take a look at it in the Bible. Turn me to the book of Psalms. Right about the middle of your Bible, you'll find the book of Psalms. We're going to go to Psalms 39. There in Psalms 39... Love the sound of pages turning, by the way. Praise the Lord. You guys are bringing your Bibles. God is good. Psalms 39. We're going to take a look at verse number 4. King David is right, and really the Holy Spirit is pointing something out to you and I. That's why this is preserved in Scripture for thousands of years. Psalm 39, verse 4, he writes and he says, Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the measure, some translations say, the number of my days? Why? That I may know how frail I am. Now, this is King David that's writing this. This is a mighty man of God. 
This is a guy who the Bible records was, was valiant in battle. From the time, from, in battle, not in battle, in battle, okay? From the time he was young, he went out and he did great exploits for the Lord. Remember, he said, I've killed a lion and a bear with my bare hands defending the sheep. I mean, this guy, he, he had some gusto, right? This, this guy had, had, had some manly tendencies inside of him, and he was an adventurer. This guy went after Goliath. He didn't let that hold him back. He had such a heart for God. He said, who is this, right, that would defy the army of the living God? Oh, my goodness. He goes racing at him, racing at the army. All he's got is a slingshot and five smooth stones, and he sinks that into Goliath's head. You know why I believe he had five smooth stones? Because there was Goliath. That was one. But Goliath had four ugly brothers, okay? And I believe that David was getting ready to kill some giants, Here's David and his mighty men. I mean, they're going out and they're doing great exploits. They're, they're, they're defending their land. And David was such a mighty man that maybe he was like some of us in this room. That we so got into building our kingdom and our thing and doing our stuff that we forgot that we weren't invincible. And so here he is saying, Lord, teach me. Show me my end. Let me know the number of my days. Why? That I may know how frail I am, not how mighty I am. Not how great I am. The Bible says that you and I have a vapor time here on the planet. It's here one second, and then it's gone the next. It's like a flash. Even if you live the full 120 years on the earth, that's not even a long time in comparison to eternity. And so we need to know that life is short, that the time is short, that we don't have forever to make decisions. We've got to know the number of our days, and we've got to get in line with the things of God. We've got to use some wisdom. Got to understand our days. Got to understand our life. Jesus understands all this. He understands monotony. He understands boredom. He understands heartache. He understands pain. He understands suffering. And yet he can sympathize with how frail we are because he experienced that frailty. He experienced the human experience. He lived it out perfectly. And so he understands that for you and I. You're there in Psalm Chapter 39, turn with me to this 90th Psalm, Psalm number 90, a couple pages over there. And in Psalm number 90, Moses is writing. Moses starts talking to God and he says, Lord, a thousand years is like a, a, a yesterday to you after a thousand years have passed. It's just like a blink of an eye, like you just woke up from a sleep. And so here he is seeing how great God is and how eternal God is. And, and, and he starts to take a look at his own life. And look at what he says in Psalm 90, verse number 12. Psalm number 90, verse number 12 says, So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. See, it's not about just living life. It's about living life well. It's not about just knowing how to do life. No, this is about having wisdom in life. Not our wisdom, not our way, not the way of man. See, the way of man is just build up as much as you can, and whoever dies with the most toys wins. That is not what God wants for our life. Our life is to be on purpose. Our life is to be lived out like Jesus. Our life is to be a, a life filled with the, the purpose and the vision and the destiny of God. You say, well, that was all about Jesus. Of course Jesus had a purpose. Of course Jesus had a plan. Well, listen, isn't Jesus living his life out in you? Isn't that what the Bible says? That the life we live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us? See, now Jesus is living his life in and through us. That means that you have a purpose. You have a plan. You have divine appointments. You have a destiny. You've got things that God wants you to do. You've got places to go, people to see. There are assignments for your life, and God wants you to fulfill your destiny. I should have had a bigger amen than that, but that's okay. Psalm chapter 90, verse number 14 this time. Drop down from verse number 12 to verse number 14. Look at what he says. Oh, satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad. How many of our days? All our days. All our days. Yes, sorrow may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Jesus knows our frailty. He knows our weakness. But also, when you live a life and you number your days with wisdom, and when you start to manage your time with the wisdom of God and start seeking out the purposes of God, God, what do you want me to do on the job today? God, God, show me. Lord, at break time, where do you want, where, where do you want my attention? God, 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 when, I, when I'm there with the kids at home and I see the neighbor out taking the trash out, show me the direction, God. Show me the vision. Show me the wisdom, Lord. 
God, God, give me a divine appointment today. God, bring someone across my path that I can minister to and that I can build the house of God with. And start to seek the wisdom of God. Satisfy us early with your mercy. See, God can sympathize with us. God knows our frailty and weakness, and therefore God wants to pour out his mercies on our lives. Why? That we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Can you say amen? amen. And number one, God has the number of our days. Number two, God has the number of our forgiveness. Sure got quiet. But God has the number of our forgiveness. Listen, God knew how many times you and I would mess up and sin. God knew that before we ever did it. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth. That means that before you and I ever messed up, ever rebelled, ever entered into sin, that God already knew Adam and Eve would fall. He knew that their children would fall and on and on and on, all the way to you and I. And yet, he knew that for each and every time we would sin, that each and every time he would forgive through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at it together. Turn back with me to the New Testament, to the book of Colossians. We're going to take a look at Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. And verse number 13. Colossians chapter number 2. And verse number 13 says these words. It says, and you, everybody say in me. Amen. Oh, come on, you got to play with me today. And you, everybody say in me. Amen. See, this is not just written to the Colossians. This is not just a preservation of something that we can, you know, maybe read about and learn about how they were doing. No, this is about you and I today. The Spirit of God is speaking to you and I. And every time you see in the Bible that it says you, take that personally. God's talking to me right now. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, look at this, he is made alive together with him, speaking of Jesus, having forgiven you 16 of your trespasses. I'm sorry, it doesn't say that in your Bible? Oh, Okay. He is made alive together with him, having forgiven you some of your trespasses. Oh, it doesn't say some? Having forgiven you most of your trespasses, but he still is pretty angry about the bad ones. <laughs> it doesn't say that in your Bible? What does it say in your Bible? All. Oh, it says what? All. all. You know what all means? All. All, all means all. Not just some, not just most. Not just the, the easy ones to forgive. No, Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, it opened the way for all of your sins to be forgiven. God knew the number of your sins. He knew how many times you and I were going to mess up, and he was ready and willing to forgive each and every one of them. Wow, how great that is. Now, not only did God know that we would need to be forgiven, but also he knew that we would need to forgive. Mm. His compassion and forgiveness must be expressed in and through us as well. Hold, you there, hold your finger there in Colossians. We'll come back there in a moment. Turn back with me to the book of Luke. And this time in Luke, we're going to go to chapter number 17. Luke chapter number 17. Jesus is speaking about offenses. He says, listen, people are going to make you mad. People are going to do you wrong. People are going to sin against you, and they're going to offend you. Get ready. It's going to happen, even in church. Verse number three comes along, and look at what he says. Take heed to yourselves. Don't be so concerned with everybody else. Take heed to yourselves. Offenses are going to come, so watch yourself. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Now, we would love to end the verse right there, right? You messed up. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. <laughs> Dirty, rotten scoundrel. How dare you sin against the man of God? But the verse doesn't stop there, does it? No. It goes on. What does it say? It says, and if he sins against you, rebuke him and... If he repents, 
Forgive them. Well, we don't like that. No, they wronged us. They messed us up. They were mean. They were wrong. That made me angry. And I like to be angry. And yet Jesus says, forgive them. No, he doesn't stop there. Look at this, verse number four. And if he sins against you seven times in a day. Oh my, now we've got a problem. Why? Because fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you, right? I'm not going to be nobody's doormat. I'm not going to get used, abused, chewed up, and spit out. Mm -mm, not me. You do me wrong once, that's okay, I'll forgive. But after that, I'm watching you, right? And we want to hold a grudge. We want to get mad. See, I, I did some math. Seven times in a day, assuming that you sleep eight hours in that day, means that you've got a certain number of hours that you're awake. If you divided that number by seven, you would get about two hours and 20 minutes. Now, if you were with somebody all day long, and every two hours and 20 minutes they were offending you and sinning against you, you would start to get annoyed. At least I know I would. Not just annoyed, I'd get mad. See, if I, if I was in a counseling situation with somebody and they said, man, every two hours and 20 minutes, this person is offending me. They're wronging me. I'd say, get away from them. What are you doing hanging around them? He'd say, but they're my family. Okay, ignore them. Turn the ringer on the phone off. Shut the blinds and turn the TV down so they can't hear it. And yet Jesus doesn't take that approach, does he? What is he saying? If he sins against you seven times in a day, every two hours and 20 minutes, and seven times in a day, every two hours and 21 minutes, returns to you saying, I repent. You shall forgive him. Wow. Peter comes to Jesus after Jesus is telling him about offenses and church discipline and how if someone offends you, go to him on a personal level, confront the issue. If they don't listen to you, take someone with you that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every matter be established. And then if they still don't listen to you, take the whole church, right? So here Peter is hearing about church discipline and, and how things should be handled and he, he, he thinks he's real spiritual and he says, Jesus, how often should I, should I forgive? You know, up to seven times? Thinking he's doing good with seven, Right? Jesus blows that number out of the water. He goes, no, I say unto you, seven times 70. Now, again, I did some math. It's 490 times. If you lived 80 years here on the earth with somebody, and every two and a half years, they were offending you, I would say that is not a healthy relationship. And yet Jesus says, listen, it's not about a number. It's not what this is about. See, numbers in the Bible, oftentimes when you see them repeated over and over again, you, you find out that God is speaking something like the number three. That's God's number, the Trinity, right? Also, the number 10, the number of completion or strength. Here is the number seven. Seven is God's number. Seven is the perfect number. So if your friend sins against you seven times in a day, if he perfectly messes up and sins against you, Jesus says and repents seven times in a day, you should forgive him. That means you perfectly forgive and so now here's Peter saying, should I forgive him up to 70? He says, no, I say unto you seven times 70. That means that you and I have a responsibility as many times as they mess up to perfectly forgive them. Let me prove it to you in the scripture. You still got your finger in Colossians? Turn back there to Colossians with me. This time Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 13. So maybe a page or two over. Colossians chapter 3 and verse Number 13, he says, we're to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering in verse 12. And then verse number 13 comes along, and he says this, bearing with, oh, let me say it again, bearing with, mm, one more time, bearing with one another. Bear with me, bro. Come on. Bearing with one another. And forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, look at this, even as Christ forgave you. Now, now hold on a second, because in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 12, we just learned that Christ forgave how many of our sins? Some? Uh, most? 
all, all of our sins. So even as Christ forgave you all of your sins, look at the rest of the verse, so also you must do. Not should do, not maybe do, must do. Just like you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must forgive completely. When he has forgiven us all of our sins, then we should forgive others all of their sins. Are you listening today? Come on, let's give the Lord an amen. amen. Hallelujah. So God has the number, number one of our days. Number two, God has the number of our forgiveness. Last things for today. God has the number of times we will rise again. Oh, well, see, we thought we were done. We thought it was over. Oh, but it's a dead situation, God. The divorce is final. The house has gone to the bank. I got the pink slip from the job. The, the, the kids have made up their mind, and, and they're, they're, they're going their way. They're doing their thing. They're in jail. The, 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 the people have turned their back on me. It's a dead situation. And yet God says, am I not the God who raises the dead? See, God knows the number of times that we will be raised up again. And here is Jesus who experienced death. He went through the complete human experience from birth to suffering to even death. And yet, he is alive. Yet he was resurrected. He knows the end of all things. Listen, when Jesus walked on the planet, he had friends that died. He knew dead situations. John the Baptist, his cousin, was beheaded. His friend Lazarus, whom he loved, was in the grave after he got sick and died. And yet, even through all of this, Jesus knew the outcome. He knew that at the end of a road of suffering and even death, that it was not the end and he would rise. What does that mean to you and I? It means that there are many dead situations we will encounter in life. Many things that are going to halt. Many things that, that, that are going to hurt and we're going to say, I don't understand, God. Why is this thing screeched to a halt in my life? It looks dead, God, and yet God says, just trust in me, child, because I'm the one who raises the dead. Proverbs chapter 24. Turn there with me. Proverbs chapter number 24. Right after the Psalms, you find Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, and take a look at verse... Number 15 and verse number 16. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 15 says this. It says, do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place. Why? Verse 16. For a righteous man may fall seven times. Remember, this is not talking about seven as in the number. This is talking about perfect. A righteous man may fall perfect. He may, he may completely, utterly fall down. You might plunder his goods. You might take everything away from him. And he might be destitute, devastated, sitting there in a ditch. He might fall seven times. Look at this. And rise again. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. Now, we saw the righteous fall seven times in the New Living Translation. It says one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. You see, sometimes we look at the wicked and we say, well, I don't understand this, God. I'm doing everything I know to do. I'm working hard at this thing. God, I'm trying to have a relationship with you. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm going to church every time the doors are open. I got involved in that class. Lord, I got baptized. I'm trying everything that I know to do. God, I'm tithing. I'm giving. I'm serving, Lord, and yet it doesn't seem to be enough Still not making it at home, still having the same problems, still going through pressures, still going through trials. People are hating on me, God. And yet, look at the wicked man. Look at these people that don't even serve you. They don't have a care in the world. Things, things just seem to fall in place for them. Why is that, God? Why do they have so much favor in their life? Why are they driving that car? Why are they living in that house? Why do they get the promotion at work? God, I just don't understand. And yet God says, child, even though you may be falling down seven times, you will rise. But one calamity, and that person's going down. 
How many people do we know that invested everything into their finances, building their kingdom? Here they have their retirement programs. Here they've invested in real estate. And what happened? Boom, it came down. And there are people out there that one thing took them out. But church, even though we may have fallen down, even though we may have had a setback, God says, I'm setting you up for a comeback. God says, I'm the one that raises the dead. And as you fell down, you will rise. You there in Proverbs, turn with me to the book of Psalms. Last verse for today. Psalm, this time chapter 34. Psalm 34. We're going to take a look at verse number 19. Psalm 34, verse number 19, starts out with a word that talks about numbers, talks about volume. What does it say? It says, many. Many what? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Listen, if somebody told you that when you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ that it's easy street from then on, that is not good preaching. Why? Because the Bible says that through many trials and temptations we must enter the kingdom of God. It says that all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer. Those are the promises that we have coming from the Bible. Now, before you get discouraged, even though many are the afflictions of the righteous, take a look at the next word, but. That means it doesn't matter. Why? But the Lord delivers him out of them all. That means it doesn't matter how many afflictions you're going through. That all of those afflictions, you stack them up, and God's going to deliver you out of each and every one of them. God will take you through them. So how do we get back to this thing that we talked about last week called compassion? Well, see, if this stuff works in our life, then as we see this in others' lives, then we need to have compassion and we need to do something with this. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. And therefore, God is not just wanting us to number our days. He's wanting us to help other people to see the frailty of life. See that time is short, that heaven is real, that hell is hot, and that they can go to heaven with Jesus. God, God wants us to help other people in this area of forgiveness. See, if we've been forgiven, then yes, we can forgive, but also we can help other people who are struggling in this area. Somebody comes to you complaining, man, they messed up. I can't believe that they did. Well, listen, forgive. Forgive. Jesus Christ forgave you all your sins. Now you should release them and forgive them all of their sins. And finally, yes, even though we may fall and get up seven times, there's some people falling down around us and they don't know that God has a plan for their life. They don't know the power of God. They don't know that God has good things ahead of them and that God wants to stand them up and set their feet on a rock. And it's time, church, to see the needs of the people around us and see the people that are failing and falling around us and to be moved with compassion and to say, hey, friend, let me help you up. Listen, it doesn't have to be this way. One little disaster doesn't have to put you down forever. Jesus Christ has the answer. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. <laughs> Lift somebody up. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Hey, if you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, let's give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to speak to everybody, talk to you about your life. Just like we talked about today, that life is short. And we only have a limited number of days here on the earth. And because life is short, we need to realize that eternity is long. And that hell is hot and heaven is real. And sometimes people say, well, I don't believe hell is real. Well, listen, Jesus did. God did. It doesn't matter what you and I say. It matters what God says. And in the Bible, do you know Old and New Testament, God speaks about hell and Jesus talked about it. So it's a very real place. And just by denying its existence doesn't mean you're going to get out of it. Sometimes people say, well, you know what? I appreciate what you're trying to do. You get to heaven your way. I'll get to heaven my way. You got your truth. I've got my truth. You know, everybody will get there somehow. Listen, do all roads lead to the moon? No, absolutely not. There's only one way you're going to get there, right? So what makes us think it's any different with heaven? Oh, we can just go whatever way we want to do and do whatever we want to do. God will just let us into heaven. doesn't matter how you lift. No, that's, that's foolishness. See, God sent his son Jesus. He was beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Don't you think that if God went through all of that, that he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does in the scriptures. Sometimes people say, well, that's cool because, you know, I know God lets good people into heaven and all you got to do is be good enough to get there. Well, listen, show me how good you have to be. 
Where, where does it say that in the Bible? Could you, could you tell me how good you have to be? Well, if you're trying to get there on your own, the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to get there by being good. You can't be good enough. The Bible says your goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. Listen, filthy rags will get thrown out of heaven. Not going to get there just by being good. Sometimes people think, well, if I go to church and attend and, you know, if I do a lot in the church, I was raised in church. You know, parents told me we were Christians and took me to religious classes. I wore religious jewelry and baptized or christened as a child. It's all great. and I'm glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where you are raised in church and you get to go to heaven. Where you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or Christ. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible say that'll get you into heaven. Sometimes people think, but, but I'll get, I get involved. I've been involved. You know, I sang in the choir, helped out, carried the pastor Bible, made decisions, and even got a, a membership card to that church. It's great. I'm glad you did those things, but could you show that to me in the Bible? Where it says that church involvement gets you into heaven, like you do enough or serve enough, and God says, oh, okay, you did your time, sang in the choir, Carried the past Bible, made decisions in the church. People think of you as a leader. You get to heaven. It doesn't work like that. God's not looking for your membership card when you went to the gates of heaven. Sometimes people say, but I know God. I know about Jesus and Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas every year of my life and sing the songs. I could quote scriptures, tell you stories out of the Old and New Testament. Therefore, I know God and I'm a Christian headed for heaven. Listen, it's not about what you have in your head. Everybody look up at me for a second. It's not about having mental assent towards God having head knowledge about who Jesus is that's going to get you into heaven. Why do I know that? Because the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, can quote scriptures in the Bible. He's not headed for heaven. So it's not about what you have in your head that counts, but rather this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always been the same thing. God's looking for a heart. Jesus comes to a religious leader of his day, probably better than all of us in this room, did a lot of good deeds, raised up in his church, became a leader and got involved. He could quote the scripture. Hey, how about this? He sang the scripture. How many of us could do that? Gave his money. People looked to him to find out about God. And yet when Jesus comes and speaks to this guy, Nicodemus, he doesn't say, hey, Nick, man, you're just doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say it at all. Rather, what does he say? John, the third chapter, he says, you must be born Again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the coals. But this is not about what society says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the Bible, beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, third chapter in the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Wow, graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? What is lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, a little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like it's one, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together, just like this, bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, you might be saying, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be, but get over it. Why? Because think of it. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Listen, if you get into hell, you would raise your underwear on a flagpole to get out. But there are no exits in hell. And all you have is today. Listen, we're not assured tomorrow. Jesus could come back or we could go. We are not assured of tomorrow. And I have buried too many young people to think that we're assured another day. Come on, church. Let's realize the time that we're living in. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. If you need to do this, come on. You can do this in the safe and friendly church service. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. Hey, I'm a man. I'll see your hand. You put it right up. I'll count it. You put it right back down. Won't even be embarrassed. 
But then he also said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So hey, your call, your choice. I don't want Jesus ashamed of me. Come on. You don't want Jesus ashamed of you. Let's give him all of our heart and all of our life if you need to today. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you never, uh, I'm sorry, if, you, if you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart. Come on, you can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're watching, by television or on the internet, come on, you can raise your hand up right where you're at. God sees you. If you're here on campus, you can come in, or if you're watching online, you can click the blue button that says respond to God. Someone will lead you in a prayer. Here we go, inside. All right, here we go. I'm gonna count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation all together. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Up on top, nine, ten. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Eleven. Got you up there. Eleven. Wise people already. Anybody else real quick? Twelve. Thank you. God bless you. Give me a little wave. Thank you. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Thank you. God bless you. On this side. Sixteen wise people already. Sixteen. Seventeen in the family room. I got you. Anybody else down here? Seventeen. Eighteen. Thank you. Up top. Nineteen. Got you. God bless you. Twenty. Right there. Amen. Amen. More at 21 in the family room. Gotcha. Another one in there? How many? Two in the family. Okay, I got them. Got them. I think we got about 21 wise people already. Anybody else that I didn't already see? About 21 wise people already. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Real quick. Come on. Just go for it. Just pop your hand up. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should. Go for it. Anybody else? 21 wise people already. All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 21 wise people. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, all 21 of you, if you're number 22, 23, 24, or 25, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, it's not too late. In a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap, sing a song. As we do that, I want you to get a hold of your stuff, purse, Bible, friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that till we get to down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come. No one leaves. Let them come right now. You come on. Come on. Come on. From the family rooms, you can bring your kids. It's okay. Bring them on down. Come on. Come on. From the foyer, if you raised your hand, come on in. Come on, they're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, come on, come on. Let them come. Don't be rude and leave during this time. We're trying to get people forward. Come on, come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. There's room for you up here. Come on, you can come right now. Make your way to the front. They're still coming. Come on. Come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. They're still coming. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can come. You can come. Come on. They're still coming. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hey, everybody up front. Take a look up here. Put a big smile on your face. It's not a bad thing, okay? It's a good thing. You didn't come to the morgue, all right? You came to church, and you came to life, all right? God's got great things ahead of you. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. See this guy waving at you right over here in the black shirt? This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a really good guy. I know you were thinking, like, Pastor Dan was the nicest guy in the place. Listen, mm -mm, we had a vote. Pastor Dave's the nicest guy in the place, all right? So he's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are in advance, okay? Number one thing he's going to do, he's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff, a couple little booklets our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then finally, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have in church that are even nicer than him, all right? Now, these guys are friends in church. We call them spiritual personal trainers or SPTs. You'll hear that and you'll see that around campus. And SPT will do something with you. They'll sit down with you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible. That's one a week, real simple, right? They'll meet with you before church service and they'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. You heard of a physical trainer? Helps you get buff, right? Helps you get strong and all that kind of stuff. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually to help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back to serve the devil, but that you go on with God. Now listen, 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 listen. I got a promise for you. 
Here's the promise. You give us one year here at this church. One year. Stay in. Plug in. Get planted here. One year. At the end of that year, you will look back at your life and you will say, oh, my, 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 look at what God has done. I didn't know it could be this good. God's going to knock your socks off, all right? But you got to plug in. Give us one year, and it all starts with five weeks with an SPT. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah.